Hey, Legim fam. Before I start with the show, I want to tell you about Hip Kitchen Manila. It is a single parent owned store that makes healthy pantry essentials located in the country's capital. Hip Kitchen Manila makes the yummiest and thinnest cornflakes without artificial sugar. These are made in small batches as well. So get your supply of this yummy goodness from Simula PH locally, both online and offline. Their business mobile phone number is 09663-305-294. And their email address is marahuyolife at gmail.com. That's M-A-R-A-H-U-Y-O-L-I-F-E at gmail.com. Alternatively, make sure to check out their Instagram account at hipkitchenmnl. And everything will be in the show notes as per usual. Okay, now on to the show. Bayol Magiales wore a beautiful striped hijab with the colors black, some kind of purple, and hints of silver. She has a thin face, high cheekbones, watery eyes, and a serious but unsure look. As I watched her talk in this YouTube video, I could picture her in her 20s, a young, beautiful, and elegant Muslima in 1970s Mindanao. Young Bayol was most probably not naive as to what was going on in the country, even though she was far away from anything that was happening in Manila. But she also probably did not expect that some 45 years later, she would be talking into a camera, telling the whole world that by September 1974, life as she knew it changed completely. That she would witness violence being inflicted on her loved ones, but would also experience violence and a violation of her body. That she would have to go to extremes to survive what felt like a rehearsal to genocide. She probably did not realize then that her voice, her melancholic face that now bears just a few wrinkles but a lot of pain and trauma, would go on to inform a new generation of Filipinos about an atrocity committed on her small community. An atrocity, the ripple effects of which still haunt and hurt the younger ones in her barangay, not only because of generational trauma, but because some Filipinos have deliberately chosen to disbelieve the events of the 24th of September 1974 in a small town in Sultan Kudarat, choosing revisionism instead of historical facts. This is the story of the Palimbang Massacre. Mabuhay, Lagim fam. Welcome to episode eight of Lagim, a Filipino true crime podcast. My name is Christine Abrigana, and I am your host. In the next three episodes of this season, I will be focusing on three cases that took place in the martial law era. I get so many suggestions of high profile and lesser known cases from this rather dark period in Filipino history that I finally, finally decided to make a mini series within this podcast. Today, I will be covering the Palimbang or Malisbong Massacre. In two weeks, I will focus on the Archimedes Trajano case. And in the two weeks after that, I will conclude this series with the case on Liliosa Hilao. At least that is the plan for now. If there are any changes, I will just have to surprise you on publishing day. With that being said, please make sure to check the show notes for all the ways you can support my podcast and also for links to my social media accounts. Don't be shy. Come connect with me. OG listeners of Lagim know that I always answer my DMs. So if you have any case suggestions or any comments, let me know. As always, details in this case will be upsetting to some people. So please take care of yourselves whilst listening. It might not be an obvious choice for your next Instagram-worthy travel plans, but Palimbang in Sultan Kudarat is a gem. There is a newly constructed baywalk and a sign nearby that welcomes visitors with the Maguindanawan phrase, Manisan ka Palimbang. Palimbang is beautiful. The beaches are relatively unspoiled, 
the breeze is soothing and off the coast are islands that can be accessed by small motorized boats. Away from Palimbang lies Barangay Malisbong, a landmark archway welcomes visitors to this little community of just above 4,000 people. There is a small restaurant there that offers not only yummy halal food, but also a wonderful view of the Celebes Sea. The beauty this coastal town offers belies the grief, trauma, and grudge that sit deeply not only within the hearts and minds of those who were alive during a pivotal historical event in 1974, but also in the hearts and minds of their offspring. And it all started during Ramadan on the 22nd of September, 1974. The citizens of at least five barangays within Palimbang, one of which was Malisbong, were puzzled at the arrival of naval ships near the coast of Sultan Kudarat. Soon after, the ships moved in closer. One loud bang after the other was then heard. Soon enough, the people realized that they were being shelled with cannons. The townspeople and their community were being bombed. Immediately, they sought refuge in the nearby mountains and stayed there for at least two days before someone from the Philippine military encouraged them to come out of hiding in order to start negotiations. Unsure as to what exactly would be negotiated, the townspeople in Malisbong still trusted the negotiator and made their way back to the community. But something was not right when they got there. As soon as the townspeople reached Malisbong and saw the military presence in their little village, they knew that whatever caused the naval ships to bomb them two days earlier was clearly the same reason they were now surrounded by army men. When the people of Malisbong arrived back in their barangay, all the men from the community were hurriedly forced into the Takbil Mosque. The women and children were then split into two uneven groups, with the first one being locked in a warehouse. They were told that they were being protected from their own men, a rather bizarre excuse to deprive these individuals of their liberty. The second group, on the other hand, was crudely loaded onto big naval vessels. If you thought they were safe there, think again. The women and children of Malisbong who had the misfortune to be loaded on those naval vessels were subject to the elements whilst on board. They were exposed to the unforgiving heat of the sun and they were barely given anything to eat or drink, if at all. As a consequence, lives were lost on those ships with some army men tossing the dead women or children overboard those dead women and children who did not survive the hostile environment and or torture on those ships. One of the women who was loaded onto the ships was Lasina Abdullah. Years later, she would speak about the cramped conditions in those ships and how at some point, due to severe heat and starvation, she had to watch her infant child die. The women and children, according to various accounts, were held captive on the naval ships for at least two days. After the women and children were taken onto the naval ships and even after they were released back into the village, one thing was clear. The men who on the 24th of September were forcefully gathered and locked up in the Takbil Mosque would not be heard of and seen again. At least, most of them. As it turned out, the men were held captive and then summarily executed near the mosque in batches of ten. Witnesses would later recount that some men were buried alive. Some men were nailed to the cross like Jesus was as per the Christian Bible. Other men were stripped of their clothes, brought to the beach, and forced to dig their own graves. The army would then shoot the men, killing them instantly. Their lifeless bodies were then pushed into the graves and covered haphazardly. Now, one witness who survived the many executions during those few harrowing days in Malisbong was a 40-year-old imam named Haji Muhammad Faust Piana. When the Commission of Human Rights of the Philippines made a video about the Palimbang Massacre in 2016, Piana was still very much alert and more than willing to share his experiences. 
By my estimation, Piana would have already been in his late 80s during these interviews, but when you watch him recount his horrifying experience in 1974, it was palpable how fresh that ordeal was for this old imam. Piana said that as soon as the men were forced into the mosque, he was quickly picked out as a sort of errand boy. He was spared from the killing, but he recounted that every day, a few men within the mosque would be dragged outside in batches of 10 or 5, and a few minutes later, the remaining men in the mosque would hear gunshots, screaming, and then silence. The men, quite obviously, were systematically being murdered. Biana, despite the horror and trauma from those days in September 1974, appeared to still be thankful in that YouTube video I was talking about. Yes, he was tortured, but his life was spared, and he found consolation in that. But remember Lasina Abdullah, the mother whose infant child died on one of those naval ships? Her ordeal would not end that quickly because she would later learn that her husband was rounded up in the mosque, never to be seen again. Lasina was on her own, suddenly robbed of her family and later robbed of her family's property as well. Another woman named Amina Gurao had a similar experience. One day, Amina wanted to bring her husband some food whilst the men of the village were still held captive in the mosque. Instead of allowing her to see her husband and hand the food over to him, the soldiers standing guard at the mosque thought it would be best to shoot Amina's husband right in front of her. And then there was Bayol Magiales, the woman I mentioned in my intro. Her sad eyes tell a story beyond just having seen her fellow townspeople die. The sadness is rooted in shame. Bayol, in that video by the Commission of Human Rights, admitted that out of that will and instinct to survive and live, and also the will to help her fellow neighbors to survive, she collected all the courage she had and marched up to one of the soldiers asking him for food. Bayol told the soldier that they have not eaten in at least two days. The soldier listened to her and then told her to come to where the naval ships were anchored and he would give her some government rice. Bayol recalled how she was given rice and fish when she did go to the naval ships. She probably thought, mission accomplished, she had done her best. She also probably thought that some sort of rapport was built between her and that soldier. Bayol saw a chance and had hoped that her second request for food would be granted as well. So later on, she asked the same soldier if he could escort her to the mosque. She had been wanting to see her father and was hoping that the soldier could help her with this request. The soldier said yes, told her to hop onto his jeepney to ride back into town where the mosque was located. What Bayol could not know was that the soldier never really intended to just do her these little favors without forcing anything in return. Bayol would later recount that after their little excursion to and from the mosque, it was already dark around 6 in the evening. The soldier, I suppose, felt like Bayol was at that moment more vulnerable than ever. So, he raped her. Bayol expressed the helplessness she felt when the soldier took advantage of her. As I understand it, she barely fought him off in order to survive, probably knowing that fighting back could have gotten her killed. The soldier would repeat this despicable act more than once every time Bayol asked for a favor. But you see, the favor was never just for her. Every time she went back to the soldier for something, she knew she was also helping her community, getting them some food in order to avoid starvation or worse. She paid a high price, feeling ashamed, feeling like she went against her faith and traditions. But by all, now in her senior years, does not seem to dwell on that or at least did not want to appear as if she was still dwelling on it. There is hurt in her voice still, for sure, but I could also sense a tinge of successful defiance, perhaps. Sadly, Bayol did not remain the only woman in her community who would fall victim to sexual abuse in the midst of an armed conflict. 
Ngunit may mga babae na nang hiram ng tapang at katwiran sa kinilalagyan. Kahit sabihin pang labag ito sa pananampalataya at nakagawian. May nakilala akong sundalo na sabi niya, o ano, sabi ko, sir, bigyan mo na laking bigas. Hindi sila nakakain isang dalawang araw. Sabi niya, punta ka sa nabar, magigay ka ng bigas. Binigyan nila ako ng bigas, inepe, pula na yan, at saka tinapa na walang balat. Yun nga. Sabi ko, pwede na lang, sir, na samaan mo lang ako. Kunin ko si tatay doon sa musgi at sa dalawin ko siya. Sabi niya, pwede man. O, nagsakay kami sa, ano, Uh, Kennedy, pag uwi namin doon, gabi na sa La City, pag ay nagaan yan, Domingo na. Tapos, pag punta kami doon, gabi na, tinanong niya ako, e, ano, sabi ko, sir, kaya ang pinagsamantalaan ako ng sundalo, pinilit niya ako, na wala tang magawa, lang magawa. Pero natanggap ko na yan dahil tinulungan ko yung marami. Nakakuha ko kasi barkada ko siya sabi ko. Hindi, siya siya, hindi barkada. Gusto niya ako. Pero ayaw ko talaga, sabi ko. Sabi ko, hindi, ganito sir, bigyan mo ko ng bigas. Para makahingi ako ng bigas sa kanila ba? Kaya tiniisan ko na yan ang nagawa ko doon. War and armed conflict are never just about the video stills and photos we see of weapons being fired at people by other people or perhaps buildings being bombed. It is about the damage and trauma inflicted on the most vulnerable, especially women and girls. There is a term for it, wartime sexual violence. It is a category of atrocities on its own and it cannot be ignored. In the telling of stories such as the Palibang Massacre, the horrors endured by women and girls are usually relegated to the very end of an article or blog post or a one-liner or maybe just a footnote. But it is not a minor issue at all. In the Palimbang massacre, before the rapes even took place, a lot of the women were already driven to madness by starvation, heat strokes, and torture inflicted by members of the military. Some saw no other way but to kill themselves before anything worse could happen. Women were systematically raped on naval ships at that time, and also in the villages as soon as the massacre started in September 1974. The ages of the victims ranged from 9 years old to 60. Although these despicable actions might be attributed to just wanting to hurt the townspeople of Malisbong, rape as a weapon in warfare has, in fact, a specific function. The following passages are directly lifted from a report by researchers at Johns Hopkins University as published by the group Human Rights Watch. Quote, Rape has long been mischaracterized and dismissed by military and political leaders, in other words, those in a position to stop it, as a private crime, a sexual act, the ignoble conduct of one occasional soldier, or worse still, it has been accepted precisely because it is so commonplace. In fact, rape is neither incidental nor private. It routinely serves a strategic function in war and acts as an integral tool for achieving particular military objectives. In the former Yugoslavia, rape and other grave abuses committed by Serbian forces are or were intended to drive the non-Serbian population into flight. In Burma, rape was a part of a campaign to drive the Rohingya out of the country. Although rape is a sex-specific type of abuse, it generally functions like other forms of torture to intimidate and punish individual women. In some documented instances of rape, the abuse appears to serve not only strategic or political functions, but also the perverse sexual gratification of the attacker. (laughs) 
whenever committed by a state agent or an armed insurgent, whether a matter of policy or an individual incident of torture, wartime rape constitutes an abuse of power and a violation of international humanitarian law. The fact that rape functions in most instances as do other forms of torture or cruel and inhuman treatment makes it all the more striking that it has not been prosecuted like any other abuse. The differential treatment of rape underscores the fact that the problem, for the most part, lies not in the absence of adequate legal prohibitions, but in the international community's willingness to tolerate the subordination of women. End of quote. The link to this whole report is in the sources list on the blog, so I highly recommend that you read it as it also gives lots of examples from other international armed conflicts. I felt like I needed to create this space to highlight this particular war crime committed by the army against the people of Malisbong because it is hardly talked about. I think the army set out to hurt the predominantly Muslim population by not only killing the men, but by also violating the bodies of the women who likely have had a conservative Muslim upbringing where any sexual encounter with a non-Muslim and outside marriage would possibly be considered haram or forbidden by Islamic law. This was also the finding of the Transitional Justice and Reconciliation Commission, or TJRC. The TJRC is an independent body established by the Filipino government and the MNLF, or Moro National Liberation Front, who is generally tasked to study and make recommendations to address human rights violations, to correct historical injustices, and promote reconciliation and healing. In their work, they found that raping the women in Palimbang was not just about power and torture, it was to destroy the more fabric of the Moros in Mindanao. The women never had a choice. They were pawns in this massacre. This was all forced upon them, and still to this very day, there is a sense of shame and self-blame. Furthermore, the women's will to live and fight off their rapists was constantly balanced against their chances to survive the massacre and the army siege. Bayol perfectly embodies this. She endured the sexual violence, the shame, and the conflicting emotions she felt in order to save herself and her neighbors from starvation. I hope that moving forward in conversations about the Palimbang massacre, we can always, always highlight the plight of women and children. Actually, we must always do so. Now, before I continue with the story, I think it is important to understand what led the military down this rather bloody path straight to Malisbong. I do not think it is unknown, even to those uninterested in Filipino history, that there's always been some sort of conflict in specific spots in Mindanao, especially in the run-up to the Declaration of Martial Law and even the years after that to this very day. In the 70s, things were looking especially dire because there was a full-blown war for independence that was taking place in Mindanao. And there was also an establishment of the Bangsamoro Republic, and that was in full force as well. In March 1973, the MNLF, or the Moro National Liberation Front, waged one of their biggest offensives when they attacked Cotabato City and Holo in Sulu. The capture of Holo was stopped by the military pretty easily, but the rebel forces were nearly successful in capturing Cotabato with their leader named Hashim Salamat. The only thing that saved the military, so to speak, was an intervention by the Air Forces of the Philippines, or the AFP. The AFP provided their colleagues on the ground with reinforcements, supplies, and weapons. If this had not taken place, Cotabato City would have been in complete control of the MNLF. Both attempts to capture these two locations were not only an exercise in exerting dominance, but they were also a show of strength on the international level. 
at the time of the captures, there was an Islamic foreign ministers conference taking place in Benghazi in Libya, a country that had been supportive of the MNLF and had also provided the Moros with supplies in aid of their cause. The news of the MNLF's efforts in Cotabato and Sulu caught the attention of other Islamic countries who were sympathetic towards the plight of the Moros. These countries were willing to recognize a separate Moro state and were also committed to putting pressure on the Philippine government to consider the establishment of a Bangsa Moro state. The Philippine government was, of course, oblivious to this very well-orchestrated plan for obvious reasons. They were not privy to it, of course. What the government could also not know was the fact that another offensive was being planned for February 1974. This time, the MNLF succeeded in capturing Holo Sulu. The military had to withdraw, but not without a chip on its shoulders. The military was humiliated by this loss, and the only way to save face and show strength was to attempt a retake of Holo. Just as an important side note here, the MNLF picked out the month of February for their initial attack on Holo because there was also an important conference taking place in Pakistan at the same time. So again, the MNLF were not just showing off to the military that they can capture Holo, but they were also showing to other Islamic countries that they are capable in establishing a separate Bangsamoro state. But the military also had their own plans. This time, they were hell-bent on making sure that they could retake Holo. Naval ships were deployed to bomb Holo and napalm was used during airstrikes. It was a horrific scene. This moment in history would become known as the 1974 burning of Holo. Now, remember that the attacks in 1973 and 1974 coincided with conferences involving other Islamic countries who would then have the time and space to analyze the results of the efforts being put in by the MNLF by the time they get together in those conferences, of course. This was a deliberate move by the MNLF, as I said, to garner more international support. The problem is, or the problem was back then, after February 1974, the government had wisened up and clocked on to what the MNLF were doing. As it happened, the next big and important conference involving Islamic countries was going to take place that same year, but in September. Now, you can probably sense what I am getting at here. The military knew that something could be happening in September 1974. They feared yet another attack like that in Cotabato or Sulu. So they wanted to be ready. But whilst they knew approximately when this attack could take place, they did not know where. And so they assumed They assumed that it was going to be in Cotabato, a stronghold of the MNLF. Now, geographically, Cotabato is kind of flanked by two big rivers. It has several smaller waterways within its territory as well. The military knew this and thought that the best way to strike Cotabato was to deploy naval ships. Now, bear also in mind that the whole country was already under martial law at this point. So Marcos had free reign in putting into political positions military men who he could, well, control. And this was a big advantage for him in Mindanao. So, anticipating the continuing conflict in Mindanao and Cotabato specifically, Marcos appointed Colonel Carlos Cajelo as governor of Cotabato and Maguindanao. He was then replaced by Governor General Gonzalo Shonko, and this man would become pivotal in the Palimbang Massacre. When it became a possibility that another attack by the MNLF was imminent in September 1974, Shonko did not apply some level-headed reasoning in investigating and then planning some sort of action against any rebels. Instead, Shonko went absolute gung-ho and thought that the best way to preemptively combat a possible attack was to flush out the enemies who were believed to be living amongst civilians. 
He felt empowered in this course of action because, after all, it was confirmed to him that rebels were indeed massing up in Palimbang specifically. The only problem with this crude and inconsiderate plan was that no one in the military, not even Shonko, gave orders to make sure that civilians were separated from combatants. Military men on the ground could not be bothered with this specific action either in the absence of such orders. All men were considered fair game, as one journalist wrote for Rappler. I'm sure that listening to this historical background information about what precipitated the massacre makes this unconscionable military operation even more alarming and disturbing. In the end, the Palimbang massacre claimed around 1,500 lives, mostly civilian men who were fathers, grandfathers, brothers, and sons. It also resulted in the countless acts of rape and sexual violence perpetrated on women and girls. Lastly, it also resulted in the destruction and loss of property, something that still impacts the descendants of the massacre victims and survivors to this very day. The Palimbang massacre ended eventually. Sources online are unclear as to when exactly, but the army retreated one day, leaving the community reeling. Little by little, the community learned about the full extent of what happened to them. As it turned out, over the few days, when the army executed the village men summarily in Malisbong, they had dug shallow graves to get rid of the dead bodies afterwards. It became also clear to the survivors later that the army, having received their orders to leave Palimbang in a hurry, really did not make much of an effort to properly bury the men, covering them but not really concealing them. Yet another indication of how little the military cared for the people that they had just terrorized. What puzzled a lot of the townspeople, however, was that the bodies found in those shallow graves did not really correspond to the number of people that were lost in the community. There should have been more bodies, they thought. Alas, in the months and years to come, this horrible mystery would be solved. Months after the massacre, human remains were recovered from a fish pond in town. During another time, the townspeople were digging a well as part of a water supply project and instead of only finding water, the workers found several human remains. Years after, several bones would endlessly wash ashore, reminding the townspeople over and over again of the pain, hurt, horror and loss they had to go through, knowing they could never give their loved ones and friends a proper Islamic burial. The people of Palimbang and those in neighboring communities carried this hurt and sense of loss for decades to come, only to be told that what happened to them actually never happened. For years, the government had ignored the pleas for recognition, acknowledgement, and reparation by the people of Palimbang. Influential people like Juan Ponce Enrile is a big Palimbang denier, and he would not remain the only one as time went on. It would seem to me that as we move further away from the memories of the martial law atrocities, the more comfortable some people have become in erasing or minimizing the effect that era had on people of that generation and the generations thereafter. That is a reason why, for example, people were eventually either okay or apathetic to the Marcuses making a comeback to Filipino society and politics. Marcus's children, specifically Bongbong and Aimi, managed to come back to the Philippines, rebuild their image, and even run successfully for office, with Bongbong, for example, being the front runner in the current presidential elections. Meanwhile, martial law deniers and the deniers of the Palimbang massacre increased in numbers. From where I am sitting, this must be an extreme version of adding insult to injury, if I ever saw one. Nevertheless, in 2014, something slightly shifted. 
The normalization annex of the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bangsamoro was signed on the 25th of January 2014, which then allowed the creation of the TJRC, the commission I had mentioned earlier. This must be one legacy of the late Noi Noi Aquino that I can remain impressed with. With the creation of this commission and the signing of the agreement came also an official recognition by the government through the Commission of Human Rights that, yes, this massacre took place. Yes, countless innocent lives were lost. And yes, reparation is a good start to pave the way to healing and reconciliation. Those who lost their lives during the massacre have officially been recognized as victims of martial law human rights abuses, and their families were officially awarded claims to a 10 million fund set aside through a law that is called the Human Rights Victims Reparation and Recognition Act of 2013. But is this enough? What about the other victims from other years and regions? What will happen to them? I suppose these questions are hard to answer because we might want to do more, show more solidarity and lift up the affected communities more, but the government should want to do that too, especially because it is voted in by the people. But we all know the Philippines is nowhere near close to a perfectly functional democracy. So... I want to close this episode with a few thoughts and questions as well that we can take with us even after this episode has played out. I am sure you will have recognized that amongst many other things, the treatment of Mindanao, especially the Moros, during the Marcos era and also after it was and is rooted in Islamophobia. In the Philippines, Islamophobia looks slightly different because of our complicated history with Mindanao in general and because we are not dealing with people of another country. For all intents and purposes, we are dealing with fellow Filipinos. Now, the colonization of the Philippines did not really touch Mindanao necessarily at the beginning. It was a well-established group of barangays, city-states, rajanates, and sultanates just thriving as per usual. But the Spanish wanted Mindanao. They fought, destroyed until their efforts sort of succeeded. And by the time the Americans arrived, as one author would describe it, Mindanao was sutured into the Philippines when it really was not part of it back then. To change that, of course, the Americans made sure to strongly encourage through a trans-settlement policy a mass migration of Christian Filipinos from Luzon and Visayas, my grandparents included, by the way, into Mindanao. This forced out indigenous Moros and Lumad communities who had lived there for centuries. Obviously, conflicts became inevitable, and as time went on, the Moros became the enemy, the proverbial boogeyman we were taught to hate, fear, and avoid. We forgot that they were in Mindanao first. And so we love to lift our Pinoy pride shirts and memes, talking about our diversity, kindness, and hospitality mula apari hanggang hulo. But let me ask you this, how many Filipino Muslim friends do you actually have? I have Muslim friends, none of them are Filipino though, so I am part of the problem as well. Naturally, I may have simplified the problem here for ease and also to fit into this podcast, but I hope you get my drift. Filipino Islamophobia is a thing, and it permeates some, if not all, of the government's past and maybe present-day policies and decision-making with regards to the Moros and Mindanao in general. For example, during the martial law era, state-affiliated armed groups in far-flung Mindanao were allowed to act with impunity on behalf of the government, who was, of course, far, far away in Malacanang and could not have easy oversight of any operation down south. One of these groups was called the Ilaga or Ilaga, a Christian extremist paramilitary group that still embraces a form of folk Catholicism. 
This group hates anyone who does not believe what they believe in, and in the past, the government utilized that hate and sanctioned their actions as a complementary force to the Philippine Constabulary. From 1970 to 71, this group was responsible for 21 massacres in Mindanao, where 500 people died, almost 200 people were injured, and 243 houses were burnt. The group was also responsible for the horrible Manili massacre in June 1971, where 70 Moros, including women and children, were murdered inside a mosque after being lured there under the guise of participating in peace talks. As for the Palimbang massacre, Darwin Absari of the Institute of Islamic Studies at the University of the Philippines, or UP, said that the massacre, apart from the historical background reason I already told you about, was also about retribution by the army, specifically. Retribution for their fallen brothers in arms. The army saw all Moros as their enemies at this point in Filipino history, so it only made sense to them to massacre whole communities that were perceived as sympathetic to the Moro cause. Islamophobia in this case was warped and has been weaponized in the worst of ways. So what can be done? What can I do? What can you do at this moment? Well, educate yourself about the history of conflict in Mindanao, for starters. It doesn't really matter if you are a northerner so far away from Mindanao or a Davaweno who is proud of your relatively peaceful city, a city that was historically occupied by Bagobos, Aitas, Matiksalugs, and Moro Tausuks. North and Central Philippines benefit from resources from Mindanao, sometimes to the detriment of the people in marginalized communities there who do not get to get their hands on those resources such as food. Mindanao and its conflicts are as much your concerns as it is the Mindanaoans. Educate yourself about how the many indigenous communities lost footing all throughout our history and how even in Mindanao, Islamophobia is alive and well. Educate yourself about Islam in the Philippines, about Mindanao itself. Recognize our colonial past in relation to Mindanao, especially if you are a Mindanaoan descendant of Christians from Luzon and Visayas. Now, admittedly, this all might seem preachy to you, but I guess in order to avoid another iteration of the Palimbang Massacre in the future, we as Filipinos must have a better understanding of the past, but not only through the lens of the government or the powerful politicians or the army even. We need to see the conflict from the eyes of people like Lasina Abdullah, Haji Muhammad Faus Piana, and Bayol Magiales. Only then can we understand that history has and will always have nuances. Lagim fam, thank you so much for listening to this first installment of my mini-series on martial law atrocities. I think someone suggested in the past I should have done this before the elections, and perhaps that person was right. However, I may have feared that my content would be viewed as serving one particular presidential candidate or party over the other, because God knows... Inferences are very easily made from just about anything during the campaign period, but I also have said over and over again that I am interested in what is good for fellow Filipinos and not what is good for one candidate or party. So learning about these martial law atrocities and producing these episodes will remain relevant with or without an election. As always, if you found this episode helpful, valuable, and interesting, make sure you follow and support my podcast by following me on social media. You can also subscribe to my Patreon, where you can get a three-day early access to my regular episodes, such as this one, and also in ad-free form. You can also donate coffee through buymecoffee.com and even use my affiliate links. All of these things will help keep this podcast afloat. All the links to these things are also in the show notes, so make sure you check those out. 
Thank you again, Lagim Fam. Until in two weeks, maraming salamat at mabuhay.